Well, welcome. Thank you all very much for showing up this morning, early this morning. Uh, my name is Dane Kennedy. I'm uh, director of the National History Center, uh, which is an affiliate of the American Historical Association. Uh, and we are the sponsors of this, uh, this briefing on history of civil military relations. Uh, this is part of an ongoing series that the National History Center sponsors uh, that provides historical perspectives to contemporary issues. I should just note uh, that the center is strictly nonpartisan and that the purpose of the program is not to advocate for any particular policies, uh, but rather to provide the historical context uh, that we believe can help inform policymakers and the public as they deal with difficult issues. Uh, I want to acknowledge the support of the Mellon Foundation uh, for this, uh, this series and uh, give thanks to Amanda Perry, who's right out there in the, uh, the, the hallway, uh, our assistant director who helped to organize this. So I'll now turn the proceedings over to Jacqueline uh, Witt, who is uh, a professor at the Army War College. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Dane, for the introduction. Um, I should say before I say anything else that given my place of employment, all of the things I'm going to say are my own views and do not represent an official policy of the Army War College, the Army, the DOD, or the US government. Um, so with that formality sort of out of the way, we'll turn to the topic at hand. So the headlines and the stories about civil military relations in the Trump administration just keep coming. Uh, on Saturday, the Boston Globe published an op-ed titled America's Slow Motion Military Coup. And the first line is a little ominous. In a democracy, no one should be comforted to hear that generals have imposed discipline on an elected head of state. That was never supposed to happen in the United States. Now it has. Last month, Philip Carter at Slate Magazine warned that as much as liberals might like it, the DOD's obvious, if relatively mild, public pushback against the president's tweets about transgender policy in the military was actually cause for grave concern. We have news stories and commentary that are routinely referring to Secretary James Mattis, General Joseph Dunford, Chief of Staff John Kelly, and National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster as, quote, the adults in the room, responsible for being level-headed and tempering the impulses of a perhaps volatile and inexperienced president. President Trump has suggested that he will leave many significant decisions in the hands of general officers and commanders, and he often refers to them as, quote, my generals. Uh, so these are all matters that should give scholars and observers and participants in the 21st century civil-military relationship pause, if not cause for concern. At the very least, I think it suggests that we ought to look very carefully about our assumptions about the norms, values, and institutions that we assume operate to ensure civilian control of the military. We also have the question about the presence of high-ranking, either serving or retired, military officers in positions of power and influence. And this seems noticeable, I think, in part because in many elite circles, military experience of any sort appears to be largely absent. Uh, Congress counts a relatively high number of military veterans among its ranks, about 18 to 20 percent, uh, compared to about 8 percent of the population at large, and about 13 percent of men in the United States. Uh, in the business world, we've seen the number of CEOs in large publicly held companies uh, dec with military experience decrease actually quite dramatically. In 1980, about 59 percent of, uh, of these CEOs had military service, and today only about 6 percent do. Uh, within academia, the number of veterans, uh, either students or faculty, is likewise low. In 2016, for example, Yale reported that it had just four uh, veteran undergraduate students. Duke, two, Williams, MIT, and Princeton, just one. Uh, this is out of a total population of about two million who are eligible for education benefits. A few years ago, the Occupy Wall Street movement right, was reminding us about the language of the 1% and the 99%. Uh, and military service members invoked a different number, uh, 0 0.49, which is the percentage of Americans currently serving in uniform. So taken together, I think we're left with very important questions about the fundamental nature of the civil-military relationship in the US. And these questions reach the highest level 
a political concern about civilian control and all the way down to the broader social questions about the extent to which a military should reflect the society it serves. So there are significant questions about whether a gap uh, exists, whether that's real or perceived, uh, and if there is, what the effects of that are, and should we do anything about it. And all of these questions, from the top sort of political questions to the broader social ones, are central to the important and ongoing debates about the composition, mission, and place of the US military in American society and politics. So today, I just get to ask big questions, and I'm gonna leave it to these two gentlemen uh, to help us make some sense of this. Uh, so Dick Cohn and Elliot Cohen, um, in some ways, these men require no introduction. Uh, they are both renowned scholars, trusted advisors, and incisive analysts. Uh, but formality, formality sort of says we do introductions anyway. Um, so Dr. Richard Cohn is Professor Emeritus of History and of Peace, War, and Defense at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I should say go, go Heels. Um, he, would, he happened to be also my PhD advisor. Um, <laughs> so full, full disclosure. Uh, he has taught very many courses in military history and civil military relations at Chapel Hill and at institutions across the country, and was the chief of Air Force history from 1981 to 1991. Uh, Dr. Cohn, uh, as you can see in the bio that you have in front of you, has written extensively about historical and contemporary civil relations in the United States. Uh, I think his book, Eagle and, the, Eagle and the Sword, is still a standard in the field. It's still required reading uh, for military historians and for those of us who seek to understand the historical foundations of the military establishment in the United States. Uh, his edited volume on 2001, Soldiers and Civilians, is likewise a uh, must read. And I think he's still currently working on essays and another book on presidential leadership um, in, in his spare time when he's not speaking and, and talking to his former students and assuaging our anxieties and calming us all down. <laughs> um, and then Elliot Cohen is the Robert E. Osgood Professor of Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins University at the School of Advanced International Studies uh, here in town. He's been there since 1990. Before that, he taught at Harvard and the Naval War College. Uh, his most recent book is The Big Stick, The Limits of Soft Power and the Necessity of Military Force. Uh, so you may be familiar with that. And then on the topic of civil military relations, uh, Dr. Cohen's uh, best known work is Supreme Command, Soldier, Statesman, and Leadership in Wartime, in which he formulates the unequal dialogue as a theory of civil military relations. Uh, he's a prolific author, certainly of books, uh, but also of tweets, which we know are very important these days, uh, and also uh, some really uh, quite uh, incisive public commentary in mainstream media publications, uh, such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Atlantic. Uh, so Dr. Cohen, I think, is truly a public intellectual in every sense of the every sense of the word. Uh, he has an extensive experience not only in academia but also in the policy world. And in 2009 to 2000, 2007 to 2009, served as a counselor of the Department of State, serving as Secretary Condoleezza Rice's senior advisor. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cohen. Just go find me, and I'll get up. Again. All right. Weak knees. Physically, not. <laughs> Metaphorically. <laughs> well, my thanks to uh, the National History Center, to Dane, to Jim Grossman, and to the Mellon Foundation for sponsoring this series. Uh, as Jackie said, civil military relations really fall into two larger categories the relationship between the military, and that's regular, reserve, National Guard. Uh, and uh, the rest of society to include major institutions, which Elliot pointed out to us, which I hadn't thought of before, the press, the media, business, academe. And then there's the relationship between the top regular uh, officers uh, in the military, the chiefs, the combatant commanders, a few others, and the civilian leaders in Congress uh, and the executive branch. And that's the area I think that we're most focused on now uh, uh, because of the current situation and which many of us have concentrated on through our studies. The worries about the gap, I think, are dominating the relationship between the military and society. Uh, and those worries have increased in the last 30 years. The evidence of declining participation 
in the society uh, and the population and the uh, declining numbers of veterans in uh, areas of responsibility, the growing numbers of military people as a percentage coming from military families or from specific areas of the country, the declining percentage of veterans uh, in Congress. And I also think that the, the lack of understanding of the military by the public and the, and the caricaturing of the military in the media, uh, particularly Hollywood and, and uh, uh, much of the public discourse. And on the other side, what I detect to be a declining respect for the values, norms, and behaviors in civilian society by the military. I don't worry about this as much as many of my colleagues, uh, because throughout American history, at least until the Cold War, uh, you had a small, regular army, uh, and uh, it was divorced from society in many respects. Uh, we pursued a policy of mobilization in which we uh, kept that small army and Navy uh, to, for leadership in war uh, and to keep up with um, military affairs, uh, and then mobilize the society. But one of the major uh, differences, uh, I think, of the last 50 years has been the reliance on a professional military and the decline of citizen soldiering, even though all of these people are citizens, or at least the overwhelming majority of them are, uh, because the, the sense of an obligation to serve I think has declined in this society, although it's still there in law. Now at the top, which is what I'm going to focus on for the most part, the prime directive, I don't know if you all remember uh, Star Trek, that wonderful <laughs> series uh, <laughs> back in the 60s. The prime directive in civil military relations is civilian control of the military, or also phrased at the time of the Constitution was written as military subordination to civilian authority. And there's a difference in those two terms, because as I think about the American government, nobody is really in control of anything. <laughs> this concept was, both concepts were baked into political culture by the early 18th century, and they pervade the US Constitution, even though they're not stated explicitly in the Constitution. If you analyze its structure and the powers, and the way in which it works, uh, it is really central uh, to the way our government uh, has worked. But in truth, all three branches of government exercise civilian control of the military. We tend to think of it as an executive function, uh, and in decision making it is. But in many respects, uh, Congress is intimately involved in a broader way on a larger range of issues and with greater influence on the armed services than is uh, the executive branch. The president is in command as the commander in chief, but making decisions on interventions, on wars, on policies are not necessarily the same uh, as what Congress does. And the relationship with both Congress and the executive branch has had as much miscommunication as unease, tension, distrust, and on occasion outright conflict as there has been cooperation. And that's not well known, uh, I think, either among the public, among the political leadership, and particularly uh, among the military. Remember that the military uh, turns over. Uh, every, every commander of a war is on his first or her first tour as a commander in war because they're, they're, they're uh, functions change and their uh, duties change as they move up the chain of command. Remember, too, that civil military relations is always situational. It's dependent on the context, the people involved, and the issues or problems. As an historian, I'm not a great one for theory. And I could give you a long screed about, about the failures of Samuel Huntington's uh, The Soldier in the State uh, from its very publication, not just as it become, became outmoded. But the point I want to make this morning is that civilian control has come under growing stress uh, since World War II. Uh, 
And we're not talking, when we talk about civilian control or military subordination, we're not talking about a coup. It's almost unthinkable. In fact, it is unthinkable in the American system. It's been thought of uh, on at least two occasions by some senior military people under extraordinary stress uh, in the early 1860s, uh, in the early 1780s. But, uh, you know, when they first considered it in 1780, some of the leading generals said, well, you know, this wouldn't work anyway. It would just create civil war in the United States. Because already, military subordination was, as I said, baked into uh, the culture. The real issue is the relative influence on decisions and policy of the military as opposed to the civilian leadership. Now, remember that famous and successful military leaders have always commanded special respect. And when we worry about civilian control, we're not worried about people, uh, senior generals who run for, for uh, office once they retire. They've gone over to the other side. They've presented themselves as a partisan, usually as partisan, or try to, to keep the part of nonpartisan uh, attitudes or, or the appearances thereof. What we're talking about here, though, is, is really the influence of the institutional military uh, and uh, the retired military uh, on policy and on thinking in the country. And in the last 30 years, for the first time in American history, the professional military has risen to the top in uh, polls of respect and confidence among the public. Now, when the services in the late 19th century became fully formed institutions with defined roles and doctrines and missions and concepts of war fighting. It became increasingly difficult uh, to, to do uh, any uh, changes to the military or, in fact, uh, to uh, reorient policy without the cooperation of the senior military leadership. I could regale you with stories beginning in the 1880s and 90s about trying to control the Navy uh, and its uh, part, uh, partisans uh, for a, a new steel Navy or the problems that, that Theodore Roosevelt and his uh, predecessor, William McKinley, had in uh, reorganizing the military at the turn of the century because the commanding general of the Army was against them. There are always issues in this relationship. The size uh, and the influence of the military beginning in the early years of the Cold War, really beginning in World War II, uh, put the military in a position of being the arbiters of uh, most military issues uh, and, in fact, national security. <coughs> Always the issues, the budget, uh, different sets of policies. You remember the tremendous imbroglio over the open service of homosexuals in the military in the early 90s. Uh, the senior uh, uh, military people simply forced a compromise uh, on Bill Clinton. Technology has been at the root of this, the importance of the military uh, in uh, the national uh, conversation. And the armed services have on occasion exploited the divided authority between Congress uh, and the military. There has been a tremendous amount of distrust uh, on both sides. Two uh, considerations have come to uh, bother us uh, who study this subject in the last 20 years. One is the increasing partisanship uh, of the military, the intervention in uh, uh, presidential elections by retired, very senior officers. It's a worrying trend because it, it presents the military as a partisan uh, organization seemingly to the public. It sends, I think, bad messages uh, to the serving uh, officers in particular. And then the feeling among uh, many officers that uh, they could or should resign if offered, uh, if ordered to do something unethical, immoral, or in their judgment, disastrous for the country. This promise or threat implicit or explicit of resignation is really an undermining of civilian control. And insofar as that ethic has grown in the military, it's, it's really a problem. Other administrations have employed senior generals and retired, uh, uh, retired and active in top civilian posts, but rarely have they ever been so clearly around the president as they are today. And I think it warps the military uh, national uh, security team. 
um, to make it more military and less broadly based uh, than it has been in the past. Um, many of us, including Elliot and myself, uh, ad advised uh, the Congress uh, to provide a waiver for uh, uh, General Mattis to serve uh, before the seven years was up uh, as the Secretary of Defense, basically because we were afraid of a combination in the White House uh, of a new and inexperienced uh, president who actually on the uh, uh, campaign trail had made a comments and still does uh, that he doesn't, and behaviors that he doesn't really understand uh, either civil military relations in general or civilian control in particular. Uh, and of course, then the National Security Advisor, Michael Flynn, uh, who seemed to have uh, a very special, um, how shall I put it, uh, views of what uh, the national security policies of the United States should be. But even with the absence of General Flynn and now General McMaster, uh, the result, in my judgment, in the executive branch is a suspension of civilian control of the military right now. Because, in fact, uh, the dominant viewpoint uh, in, in the executive branch is, is one of military people. It's also unusual to have senior retired military people in political jobs as such. Uh, and all three of these jobs, the Chief of Staff uh, of the President and the Secretary of Defense and the National Security Advisor, are political uh, jobs. And given the weaknesses of the State Department at present, uh, generals and admirals have particular viewpoints. And I don't think it, it serves the nation well uh, for uh, the President to only get a certain uh, set of viewpoints as he goes about making um, decisions. There are other pressures. Senior military officers today feel squeezed between the necessity uh, to speak up on foreign and military policy without contradicting the president, because the president is out there uh, so publicly. You saw that after the Charlottesville uh, uh, problem, when the armed services felt it was necessary, the chiefs of the services, to, to speak to the American values of racial tolerance and cooperation. Uh, I, I, I regretted that they did it, but I understand why they did it. They had to remind their services uh, and remind the people in those services uh, that uh, the values of cooperation, respect, toleration uh, would dominate uh, no matter what the background of uh, any serving uh, person was. So while the military may restrain the president, which is in itself a problem, as Jackie pointed out, for civilian control of the military, uh, I do think it does provide po the possibility of an increased likelihood of war. The lack of diplomacy, uh, the clumsy foreign relationships, uh, the Korean example right now uh, is there. And either uh, for the president, uh, who, do, who does he consult? who has real experience in other uh, alternatives uh, to either war or, in, in the Korea example, or uh, acquiescence uh, to North Korea having a nuclear weapons. Well, this is a continuing story, and it will be. But in civil military relations, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And these problems, they're different now but these problems of civil military relations are always with us and bear uh, study. Well, let me add uh, my thanks for being invited here. It's uh, good to see some old friends, and uh, it's, always, it's, it's always on the one hand good to see Dick, but he's a hard act to follow. Um, and, in part because we agree on so much. Uh, so regard this as a, just a kind of a, a commentary on what uh, Dick had to say with somewhat different emphases. So uh, just starting right at the very beginning, the, one of the things that is striking about civil military relations is that more than most subjects, it seems to me there's a real danger of the intertwining of the, of the positive and the normative. That is to say, what do we think is going on and what do we think should be going on? And uh, people who write about civil-military relations, like the two of us, I think 
occasionally wander in between those two worlds, trying to s describe things as they are and explain things as they are, which is a kind of legitimate scholarly enterprise. Uh, but as engaged citizens on the subject of cardinal importance, we're also going to have views about what should be going on. But I just highlight that as an issue to think about. Um, as, as Dick told you, I, I tend to divide civil military relations into these three levels of the society, the, the relationship between the armed forces as a set of institutions with other institutions that would include other parts of the bureaucracy, like the State Department, and then uh, let's call it issues of supreme command of uh, relations at the top. Let's begin. I think by remembering a number of things. There are a number of peculiarities to the American system which are unlike that of other countries. The president is the commander in chief. Uh, that in itself makes us different from, say, parliamentary systems in which you have you know, a king or in some cases a president who is at least nominally the commander in chief and as opposed to having a head of government. Uh, and that can have real consequences, both in how a president views the military, his generals, as, as uh, Dick just said, but also how the military thinks about um, the president. My recommendation to H.R. Uh, McMaster would, was to uh, resign his commission before taking on the job of national security advisor because I thought it critical that when he walks into the Oval Office, he should see the president, not the commander in chief. There's a, you know, I think for anybody who's been a soldier, no soldiers, there's a big difference between somebody who is really in your chain of command as opposed to the political authority for whom you work. Uh, we are unusual in the degree of influence and occasionally control that Congress can exert, um, not just by in terms of what the Constitution has, but just in terms of the staffs. I mean, people like many of the people in this room. Uh, you know, you compare, say, the staffing of the House Armed Services Committee, the Senate Armed Services Committee, with their counterparts in places like the UK or Australia, we have a much more robust system that is continually monitoring and investigating and influencing uh, and shaping. We have the further peculiarity of the relationship between the states and the federal government. Now, that has abated in many ways. Uh, in recent years, but it is still the fact that the National Guard is under a kind of dual control. It can be federalized and has been federalized uh, repeatedly, but it is all, these are also state institutions. No other country that I'm aware of has anything remotely like this. You know, you have reserve organizations and that's it, and they're part of uh, the military overall. We, we are different. Our history is a very peculiar history of both uh, occasionally militarism and anti-militarism. I think American attitudes towards the military have historically been deeply ambivalent. Uh, and this frequently strikes um, foreigners, I think, more than it strikes Americans, uh, is that there's sometimes the level of admiration for the military type, not just now, but throughout our history, really quite anomalous compared to other countries. I, I would point out the amount of suspicion of the military, though, that is, and of military power that is baked not just into the Constitution, but into the Declaration of Independence. I always tell people, read the boring bits of the Declaration of Independence, not, you know, the, uh, those magnificent paragraphs at the beginning and the end. Read the Bill of Particulars and see how much of it is about the abuse of military and naval power, things like impressments, quartering. Uh, and for me, the favorite line, which runs, I'm quoting from memory, so don't blame me if I don't get it exactly right. He, the king, has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. That, that is right at the very founding of this country and, and in the revolution, even before the Constitution. So my basic point is tension is completely normal. It takes many, many different forms in different times. This shouldn't bother us. I actually think up to a point it's a very healthy thing. Let me give you just some examples. The whole issue of the standoff, for a long time, people who did civil military relations were obsessed by the relationship between the National Guard and the United States Army. Uh, and that certainly when I began studying this with the uh, late great Sam Huntington, that was a you know a critical part that everybody got into. How you know, how does the National Guard manage to get away with it? Well, that's state politics. 
Uh, the issue which Dick alluded to of uh, retired general officers and flag officers endorsing presidential candidates. Political generals, well, let me just mention a few names to you. Winfield Scott, Leonard Wood, Colin Powell, not to mention Douglas MacArthur, all of whom in uniform ended up playing roles which many people could legitimately think were pretty dicey. Uh, so, you know, that, that issue has been out there for a long time. The issue of social norms that are at odds with the rest of society, race, gender, sexual preference, although what I would point out is the, the pattern is that the military, being naturally and appropriately a conservative set of institutions, doesn't like to change. But when it changes, it changes. And so if you look at the experience of desegregation, integration of women, uh, and then adding, uh, adding the ban on um, uh, people serving openly uh, as, uh, as gay individuals, and even the transgender issue, once the military has moved on, the military has moved on. And in fact, one of the things I found quite interesting about the whole transgender thing is at least the leadership of the United States military was, I thought, much more in tune with where most of civil society was than, let's say, the base of, uh, uh, of the president's support. Uh, so you have that. So these, these, are, these are old patterns, uh, and we should understand that. I do think that the post that, that are the kinds of issues that Dick was talking about, the post-war issues, are colored by two big changes, the fr and which which we really have to remind ourselves of. The first is simply the changed American role in the world, the fact that we are a global power with global engagement with a military which, even if it's small as a percentage of the American population, is an order of magnitude larger than that which Teddy Roosevelt had at his disposal. Uh, which is, takes up a large, very large chunk of the federal budget, even in an era of social welfare spending. So the military is simply a much more important institution than it was throughout much of the, say, the 19th or even the early 20th century. And the second is the end of the draft and the emergence of a small, smaller, competent, and extremely popular military, which is, that is a, a post-Vietnam development, but it has proven to be enduring. Uh, there's been a little bit less of a pendulum swing than I would have, uh, than I might have expected. Uh, and again, I think that too was a result of all kinds of forces, and it's not going to change. I mean, for a whole bunch of reasons I can go into, I don't think there's going to be national service or anything remotely like it. A draft would be ludicrous uh, and wouldn't work. So that's what we've got, and we're going to the challenge is to figure out how to deal with it. What are some of the current issues? Well, Dick uh, went through one of them in particular, and that is the, the isolation of the military, not just from the civilian world, but what we're really talking about is the isolation, and, and Jackie pointed this out in her introduction, the isolation of military from civilian elites. Um, I was once talking to uh, the, chief of the, uh, the British Chief of General Staff, who made the point that he said, you know, we want to make sure that we recruit our officers from the same kinds of people who end up providing our business leaders, our political leaders, our uh, academic leaders. And that's a self-conscious part of uh, their recruiting effort for a much, really much smaller military. Um, that has been a serious issue certainly since the 1960s. It persists. I'm not quite sure that it's, it's quite as bad as some of those statistics indicate. You know, you look at the number of kids who are at Harvard and Yale, uh, who are veterans, well, they're not going to be that many veterans as incoming freshmen. It's more interesting to see what some of them do after they, after they leave. But the fact of the matter is they're really small in small numbers. Um, some of this may change in the political realm, I think, in 2018. I'm struck by the number of vet young veterans running for office, particularly on the Democratic side, but I think on the Republican side there will be some as well, and that may change things. The, the main issue I would point out is the issue is not just you know how awful the universities have been in terms of welcoming ROTC. It's the, the military institutions have not been interested in this issue, um, and I think this is a, speaking now in policy terms, this together with BRAC, 
which has been done you know, purely on the basis of what's economically efficient, has all been done without a thought to what is the nature of the military's footprint in American society. And maybe one should be willing to accept some economic inefficiency, and maybe one should be willing to accept some inefficiency in officer accessioning in order to maintain a distribution. I was marginally involved in uh, trying to get ROTC back on the Harvard campus in the early 2000s. And you know, the door was wide open from Larry Summers' point of view, the president of Harvard, who had a lot of authority, while he was, at least while he was president. The resistance actually came from the military. That was the thing I took away from that, that episode. And it was, uh, it was distressing. So I think there is an issue there. The main issue, though, I want to uh, talk a bit more about then stop so we have time for discussion, is, is the issue of uh, what I've uh, perhaps indelicately called the benign junta. Uh, now, it, it is benign. I mean, I, I did testify to the Senate to get the waiver for uh, the actually change of law, not a waiver, to change the law to allow then General, now Secretary Mattis to serve. Am I glad that H.R. McMaster is where he is rather than old Steve Bannon? Yes. Uh, is it probably better for the country that John Kelly is chief of staff, you know, limiting the inflow of Breitbart uh, into the Oval Office as opposed to Reince Priebus? Probably. Do, do I have high regard for each of these three individuals? Absolutely. Um, but is it a problem? And I think the answer is yes. And it's actually a bit more of a problem than I think people realize. We are all, anybody, as anybody who's gone into government knows, we are all prisoners of our Rolodex. And so if you look at some of the second and third order positions, they're being staffed also by active duty or retired military. And that, that I think, is a kind of a secondary set of issues. And it's also, you know, an individual is one thing, a Troika is a different thing. So what are some of the issues? Um, again, let me emphasize when I say a benign junta, I mean benign. Um, but it is a serious issue. Some of the, Dick has raised some issues. Let me raise some others. First, the risk of politicization of the military, most obviously. These are political jobs, full stop. There's no way any of those jobs could be construed as anything else. In some cases, this is not the first time we've encountered this. I mentioned the names Powell, Scowcroft, and Haig. You know, that's the issue of the um, assistant to the president for national security affairs. So there's a, and there's a discussion to be had there about what's appropriate. I think there is a, a subtler issue, which is the blurring of the distinction between policy and strategy, between ends and means. Um, I think that the, the extremely heavy reliance on military officers, particularly now, has other issues. I would not want a government largely staffed by professors. <laughs> I really wouldn't. Maybe one or two here or there carefully supervised, um, <laughs> as I was. Um, but, but Anybody who's been in a total institution like the military, or for that matter, in some ways like a university, you, you are shaped by the institution. I mean, that's just, that's what happens. You spend 35 years, you think about planning, for example, you think about responsibility, you think about accountability, you think about how you set goals in a certain way. In this particular case, I think we have an issue because the, the three individuals we're talking about have all been shaped by 16 years of inconclusive war. And we should give some thought to that. It's not just that we're talking about generically um, uh, military officers. It's military officers who've served repeated tours overseas, who probably feel the losses of men and women under their command more keenly than their predecessors did in, say, Vietnam, uh, and who know that these wars have been inconclusive. I think, I think there's a set of issues there which Dick and I were talking a little bit about this informally before. Um, as Dick has also pointed out, there are particular issues in each case. I won't dwell on, on uh, any of them. I will mention one that, that you mentioned to me, which I think is very important, and that is that the job of the Secretary of Defense, and again, let me stipulate, I wanted Mattis in that job. But the job of Secretary of Defense is 
sometimes it is representing the military to American society, and sometimes it's representing American society to the military. And, and for that task, you're probably better off with a civilian. There's something, of course, obviously to my mind, dangerous about the idea that only generals can manage complicated and difficult problems. That's not what the Great Republic is all about. And then finally, and I think with this I'll conclude, I think there is a danger of a backlash. And I do think that there is a possibility that when um, a different kind of administration comes in, there will be, as, as there often is, to be fair, uh, and there was, you know, Dick Cheney was this way in the George H.W. Bush administration, feeling the military is run amok, we've got to put them back in their place. Uh, and so you have foolishness that goes in the other direction and that is, in its own way, excessive and uh, damaging. But I'll, I'll just conclude by saying, by, by emphasizing my main point, which is American civil military relations has always been filled with tensions and challenges. I, I don't think actually we're in a particularly bad place with the possible exception of this, um, of the issue of having so many senior active duty or re very recently retired military officers uh, in positions of high responsibility, further complicated by the fact that we, most of us don't think that that's, in each case, such a bad thing. Good, so we'll take questions uh, from you all. Yes, in the back. Yes, I, I have a question partly from something Dr. Cohn said, but it relates to something Elliot said. But the danger of war, greater danger of the use of military force. And I wonder because, of course, a, a lot of discussion, you know, there's the famous incident of uh, Madeleine um, uh, Albright uh, saying to General Powell, why don't we use this military, this great military, that civilians are more likely to use military force than the military. And yet, Elliot, your comment about being shaped by 16 years of inconclusive war leads me to wonder whether any use of the military in the future under this administration would be very much on the line of we've got to have conclusive um, uh, war. I'm curious if either one of you want to comment on that. Go ahead. Yeah, I, well, I think you put your finger on it. I mean, I, you know, I, because all three of um, McMaster, Madison, Kelly are, are prudent men and, um, and thoughtful men, I don't think any of them will want to rush into military adventures. But I do think they will press for things that look to them decisive. Uh, that's one, I think, one very big issue. Um, second issue is, although I think Madison doesn't quite do this, but um, there is an issue of being focused on your enemies of the last 16 years, when actually I would argue that our strategic challenges are more heavily from other, um, from other vectors. Uh, and I guess thirdly, what, one of the concerns I have, this is me, not as the scholar, but as a, uh, you know, somebody who just yells at the television set, um, <laughs> is that I am not sure that any of those three would fully grasp the challenges of going to war with a president who is profoundly mistrusted by 60% of the American people, which to my mind makes it you know, extremely hazardous to go to war. Uh, and I don't think that, that because they're not by nature, none of those three are really political people, and they're politically aware and literate and all, all of it. You know, in the marrow of your bones, if you, if you really think, I'm gonna to go to war with the guy who 60% of the American people think is a liar, about everything, then you've got a problem. I think also, and furthermore, uh, the possibility of building a coalition, which is important in American war making and has been from the very beginning. Um, this administration has not been very effective at its diplomacy with and, and its relationships with friends. Uh, and going to war in, in, in North Korea, over North Korea, uh, as Elliot has implied, is, is to ignore the real challenges, which are Russia and uh, China and our trade relationships and the international financial situation. 
My concern is, and this, this will strike you as bizarre, and that is that, that uh, the three generals we are speaking about, and I know the case in, in all three of them uh, to some degree, uh, are really very great believers in civilian control of the military. And thus, they will reflect the president's desires, no matter where they come from, or how well thought out they are, or how based they are on fact and uh, policy. And the consultation with other people, um, I, I worry that a military perspective might lead them to binary choices because the voices of alternatives, that is from di diplomats, from other people in the government, I'm not certain, in fact I've heard that the interagency system is not working very effectively yet, uh, despite General McMaster's uh, best efforts. Uh, so how will this be thought through? Uh, and uh, the three individuals are very much believers in civilian control, at least in theory. And how well will they push back in the absence of alternatives? Because the president will say, well, what choices do we have? And does the system of advice provide that? Uh, and is the diplomacy going on right now? There's scant evidence of it in the public prints uh, of uh, people getting together and talking, China, the, the, the six uh, uh, that were in this discussion before. So I worry about it. And uh, maybe I'm just in a constant state of worry as a cynical historian. Actually, let, let me just add sort of one, one story about what happens when you have a bona fide politician engaging a president with whom they, about whom they have reservations. And that was Nixon wanted Mel Laird to be Secretary of Defense in the worst possible way. And Laird negotiated a deal which is uh, on a, it's apparently written on a, uh, literally on a cocktail uh, a napkin, uh, which he then took and I think it's now in the Foreign Library, in, in which he said, okay, here are the conditions. One of which is, I get to appoint anybody I want. Anybody. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he had an almost completely staffed Defense Department almost immediately after coming in. And he, and he held Nixon to that promise. And you know, Nixon and Holloman and and all those guys were furious about it because they thought he was staffing the Pentagon with liberals, um, and to some extent he did. But you know, that, his attitude was, "I'm a Paul dealing with another Paul, and I'm going to cut a deal. If he doesn't like it, he can go jump in the lake." I mean, that's not how a general's going to think about the president of the United States, even if they're a retired general. Yes. Um, I made me think of 1968 when I was a Navy midshipman at Yale, ROTC when it was voted off campus. The issue, as it was put out, was over faculty status. So my question is about status. The, the Yale Corporation and the, and the faculty did not want to give the Navy ROTC and Army ROTC uh, assigned professors faculty status. And that carries into, I'm thinking of, the, you know, we have the Ken Burns documentary on Vietnam now, and again, during Vietnam, question of status, the military had to go through this long period of time when their status was reduced. And, and so now we get into the modern times, you have um, the Trump base challenging the legitimacy of expertise, especially university expertise. So my question kind of goes, is this certain parts of the society only, re only respect and give status to military and not to civil institutions? And, and then and that's my question. Here's, you know, I, we, I ran across that when we were having the conversation with people at And the, the Army in particular wanted the um, uh, professors of military science to be voting members of the Harvard faculty. Mm. Well, I'm sorry, that's crazy, you know? <laughs> that that's really crazy. Thing. You know, it, it's, I mean, I've got my own views about Harvard, trust me, but um, <laughs> it's, you know, you, you get to be a voting member of the Harvard faculty on the basis of significant academic achievement. And significant military achievement deserves respect for significant military achievement, but it's not necessarily the same thing as significant academic achievement. And it actually, I, I have the feeling in that particular case, after a while, it's beginning to be used as, as an excuse. 
for staying away from a place that people just thought was going to be trouble with kids who they thought were going to be trouble that wasn't going to yield a very big harvest. Truth in advertising, I have a kid who graduated from Harvard and went through ROTC at MIT. So give us a second. This is a little bit personal uh, as well. But it was, you know, it, there was something sort of absurd that I, I think that there was an extremely hostile attitude towards the military on major campuses like Yale or Harvard. But it, it that's not the world that we're in now. It really is. Which time is about the status thing. Yeah. It's like certain parts of the country. Everybody has to, if you don't stand up to the national anthem or you don't salute the flag or, you know, the baseball games, our men in uniforms, you know, support our heroes, status goes only in that one place. But it doesn't go to the whole kind of heroes or different parts of society. And, and you actively are trashing the status, expertise of, what's that famous New Yorker cartoon about the airline passenger that says, hey, I'm tired of these elite pilots. I'm taking over the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. Although, I... I've been a professor long enough to have become the mixed view of universities, so. <laughs> um, I, I, you know. Yeah, in the back. Uh, yes, um, I'm glad Professor Cohen's tweets were alluded to because I noticed a tweet you read a month ago, Professor Cohen. This oh leads to my question. You said that 99% of Americans who were not serving, that you really didn't care whether they were war weary or not because they weren't, since they weren't directly involved. It, you, you did not take them seriously. And this ties in with my acquaintance, retired Colonel Adrian Lewis's book, His Thesis in the American Culture of War, that ruling the elites of American society, not just the generals, the, and the, but the civilian leaders, and also the experts in academia, want to divorce war from the greater society. They don't want popular involvement because of the hand string. I'd like you, and especially Dick, to comment on that. So that wasn't a tweet. It was a op-ed in the Washington Post. And I had reservations about a president of the United States talking about the country being war weary, which I thought sent a terrible message to all kinds of bad actors around the world. And I said, uh, and I believe that people who are entitled to be war weary are the veterans going back for the second tour, their spouses, their parents, their children, their friends, families of those who've been wounded, people who've been killed, absolutely. People who haven't even had to pay an extra buck in taxes for these wars, who don't know anybody who served, who you know, who have no skin in the game. Um, sorry, and I guess I also push back because I think it was part of a portrayal of soldiers as victims rather than as people you respect for doing what they do. And uh, and I would also have to say, and again, some of this is personal, obviously. Uh, the soldiers I know best, in fact, all the soldiers I know, I never heard one of them say, you know, I'm so war weary. <laughs> I mean, you know, I see Dave Barno and Bill Nash, and I, I don't think I've ever heard them say, you know, I'm just war weary. That's not what soldiers say. That's because of civilian control. We, we, we uh, create uh, uh, systems and policies where we rotate people in and out of the, the war so that it becomes a, a uh, we spread spread the uh, obligation and uh, we try to maintain a force that can continue it uh, and for a, 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 an endless indecisive war you need a military that can stand it and ours does. I want to address your, your, your point though and, and that is I don't believe in this 1% 99% of business. Uh, the numbers, the numbers of veterans in this society, the numbers of spouses, families, uh, siblings, grandparents, etc., related to military people, the reserves, uh, National Guard are highly professionalized. When we did surveys in the late '90s uh, of attitudes, values, opinions, norms almost indistinguishable from the active duty military. So let's say it's really 15%, and, and then you, you get contractors and communities around these mega bases. You know, it, it may be more than 15% of the society is, is really involved here. I don't think, uh, you, you know, your point about not wanting the population to be involved because uh, it, it's, a, it's a restraint on the politicians. Uh, 
Uh, I think that came in Vietnam when, when uh, Lyndon Johnson did not want to call up the reserves because he was afraid of, uh, that the war, a fever, would affect American society and he would be driven into policies and behaviors uh, that might trigger World War III or a much larger crisis uh, than the Vietnam. Me meanwhile, the Vietnam crisis had boiled so much beneath the surface that it affected society very deeply and for a very long time and, and still does. I think what restrains uh, a president or, or a political leadership uh, from going to war uh, is understanding, study, wide uh, consultation. And what worries me is when you don't have a professional politician uh, uh, in office uh, who doesn't understand the necessity to have public support uh, for doing things that you can you know, go off the rails. Uh, and if you have people in the chief advisory and political jobs uh, that haven't thought about broadly about American war making, we have a military that's extraordinarily successful at tactics, at operations, at planning, at mobilization, at uh, uh, technology, et cetera, but has, in my judgment, been strategically bankrupt for at least a generation and probably two or three generations, in part because civilians took over the, uh, the, the strategy of business during the Cold War when we thought of strategy as nuclear strategy and, and dealing in that uh, situation. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I have this, this cynical feeling that the military does not promote its strategists, that strategy is just another, uh, another uh, uh, skill or understanding, you hire somebody to do it. The senior military make the decisions. They advise the political leadership. They have to be strategically knowledgeable, adept, in depth in order to engage in these situation room discussions and, and uh, congressional testimony. You can't just hire people and then cut them off at lieutenant colonel and colonel. Sorry for this. <laughs> a question on resignation, and uh, not, not the resignation that uh, Dr. Cohen talked about, which is active duty military officers making that choice, but the resignation uh, calculus for the Troika for these three, for Mattis, uh, for Kelly, for HR Ambassador, HR being an active duty three star general still, what's his calculus for resignation, and is that going to affect how he performs that job? And then the other two who are retired military now, will their, their lifelong commitment to a military ethos of duty in particular, and I use that term very deliberately, their sense of duty alter a, a calculus that would be expected for perhaps a different political leader in that job? And maybe from each of you. I, I, I really agree with the assumption behind your, your question, uh, Dave. It's, it's uh, a real problem. I think H.R. Uh, McMaster understands that he cannot resign um, and, and that he, in, in fact, it's part of why he was uh, chosen, I think. Uh, but I also think he considers himself as catastrophe insurance for the United States. Uh, and Madison and Kelly may see that themselves that way too. So perhaps they don't have uh, either innately in their conception of their job or in their understanding of what their role is at the present time, the ability to confront the president and to threaten the president. Um, I think McMaster is in somewhat in the situation that Sessions was in some months ago when they, uh, the president wanted to fire him and said, well, how am I gonna get a replacement through the Senate? Well, Kelly and McMaster don't have to go through the Senate, their jobs. So I worry that there is less, in some ways, less restraint. The restraint on the president right now by these three people are his, his uh, affection, uh, worship, if you will, uh, for the military, uh, his sense that they're nonpartisan, and his willingness to listen. As was always, I agree with Dick. Um, uh, there was one revealing story about um, what was the precise thing where apparently uh, the president chewed out General Kelly, and Kelly let it be known that he wouldn't go tolerate that again. 
But, so I think the other dimension to all this is a military sense of honor. Uh, I mean, I think HR will put up with just about anything, partly because he's catastrophe insurance, partly because he hasn't achieved the godlike rank of four stars. Where, you know, you're just on a, you know, you're somewhere between being a human being and an angel, um, <laughs> and, and entitled to the perquisites. Um, but but it's, it's to be serious, I think, you know, with Kelly in particular, but I think also with Mattis, there is a sense of personal honor. And I think if they get treated abusively, it will happen once. Whereas, you know, Sessions was called, apparently. The Attorney General was called an idiot. Um, resigned, if I believe Maggie Haberman, which I do, resigned, and then the President decided not to take the resignation. I think if that sort of thing happened with a Kelly or Mattis, they'll say, no, you are taking that letter of, re that letter of resignation. And so I think there's, it's another way in which, you know, a life spent in a profession which cares about personal honor uh, will change the calculus of those two men in particular. Maybe a quick follow up. Maybe not the personal abuse, which sometimes military senior officers are going to endure. You know, folks who work for Don Rumsfeld had lots of experience with that, I would suggest, uh, at a four star level in some cases. But, but in terms of a major policy disagreement or a major challenge uh, to their advice that's not taken, how do you see the resignation calculus in that particularly for- uh, Well, there, there I think what Dick described will come into play, which is that because these guys do believe in civilian control as well, the president's choice. That's why, actually, I'm more worried about Korea. They, I, I don't fully buy the adults in the room argument. I mean, I think they'll, they will give very sober arguments but I think their view will be if the president has decided we have to schwack North Korea and if this ignites a really big war, so be it. You know, they'll shrug their shoulders, roll their eyes, and then try to make it as good as they can make it. We've probably got time for just one more question. Okay. Yeah. So um, what would you recommend Congress do for people who are concerned? Do you think Congress should should continue monitoring developments, or are there changes in laws and regulations that will <laughs> You're telling two academics, uh, three academics, so what, 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 what should Congress do? I think Congress uh, uh, exercised its oversight in December and January and, and really made an issue of, of, of uh, changing the law for Secretary Mattis. Uh, Congress can uh, exercise with difficulty many of its, its clubs uh, over the executive branch. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, the uh, foreign relations and uh, uh, this is half-baked off the top of my head, uh, the foreign relations and uh, Armed Services Committees should convene hearings on strategy and alternatives and try to fill the void uh, that's going on in this administration uh, and hear from people uh, and look very carefully at the strategy and policy documents that come out of the executive branch and uh, push back if they don't think they are adequate or well thought um, they should make every effort to inject themselves into the policy and advisory process. Uh, I, I understand that Tom Cotton, for example, speaks frequently to the president uh, and, and other members of Congress. Uh, so I think the answer is to get into the arena. There's that wonderful song from the uh, brilliant uh, play uh, Hamilton. I want to be in the room where it happens. <laughs> I'd rather not, but... Uh, <laughs> you lost your chance. <laughs> I've read that one to a center. Um, so I also was very pleased that the way in which Congress went about changing the law for Mattis did not go in the direction that it could have gone. We said, well, this is a pointless law. Let's just get rid of it. I think the idea of the seven... I would have gone back to the 10-year cooling off period because there's a statement there about civilian authority and different kinds of functions. So I, you know, I would congratulate Congress on that, but I would really make sure they hold the line. 
And this is not something I think Congress can do, but you know, there are hundreds of people on um, Capitol Hill who, when they look at themselves in the mirror in the morning, see the President of the United States <laughs> anywhere between four and uh, uh, 30 years' time. Um, and I think if we can begin, one concrete thing to do is begin to establish the norm that the assistant to the President for national security affairs should be a civilian. And if it is going to be a general officer, they have to resign their commissions and you know retire, retire on not, not resign the commission, retire from the military, and come in as civilians. I think that would be a very powerful norm to create, and it would be a, it would be a useful norm. Would you to, make it confirmable? No, because I, at the end of the day, um, I, I think the president does need to have discretion about his the, the executive office of the president and who really works for him or for her directly so uh, i think you know and, uh, maybe I'll just wrap up by saying this in the in in civil military relations law is one thing and norms are the other and i think we tend to focus a lot on law but it you know as, as total pointed out long ago it's the norms and the mores that keep us free and almost as much as, as much as the laws and I think part of the effort that has to be made by all of us, whether it's academia or Congress or, or whatever, uh, and, this, and the military has been pretty good about this, doing this itself, is establishing what the norms are. And particularly after an administration that has kind of ruptured some norms, really important to do. I, I would also add that it would be very easy for Congress to do this, because my understanding is, is that the Senate had to approve um, a McMaster's assignment uh, as it does for That's all three and four star uh, officers. That's a good point. That's a good point. So just, just exercise that. Yes. Good. I'm looking at the clock and it's past 9.30. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dan and Elliot uh, for your time and for your comments. And with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you.